going to look at John chapter 13 this morning. John chapter 13. So if you open up there, I'd encourage you to keep it open because we'll look at several verses, several passages uh, in John chapter 13. Have you heard of the gospel of Judas? Did you know there was such a thing? Has anyone heard of that before? Would you raise your hand if you had? I'm not surprised <laughs> that no one's heard of it. Uh, yes, but some years ago, uh, there was a document, a papyrus, that's what they used to write on back in the day. Uh, and, and it was found in the 1970s. And it was written in what's called the Coptic language. Uh, I think most of the people living today speak Arabic, but back in uh, second, third century of uh, AD, uh, people spoke in what was called the Coptic language. And, and so you have this uh, 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 Gospel of Judas, and it's dated to about, uh, the papyrus that it was found on was dated to about uh, the third century AD 280 and then uh, after looking uh, looking at it closely some scholars thought it may have been written um, uh, actually in, perhaps in Greek and it was translated into the Coptic language and maybe it was written uh, in the second century I assure you it was not written by Judas it was not written by Judas Iscariot that's what the document claimed. That's what it claimed. And according to the Gospel of Judas, Jesus told Judas to go and do what Judas did. So Judas did not betray Jesus. He was doing what Jesus told him to do. And according to the Gospel of Judas, uh, all the other apostles got the gospel wrong. Only the gospel of Judas correctly records what the gospel was. In other words, this was a heretical gospel. And it was written by, if you, if you read it, the, and those who've done study on it, it it's, uh, the evidence is that it was a Gnostic writing. What are the Gnostics? They claim to know more than the apostles or what the Bible says. You had to come to them for salvation. If you want to know the truth, you had to come to the Gnostics. And there are groups out there today like that who will say, if you're not part of our church, you're lost. You need to be part of our church. We are the only ones who know the truth. Now, that's not the view of Baptist, at least the Baptist I know of. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you can worship the Lord Jesus in a different church. It doesn't have to have the name Baptist on it. What's essential is that the word of God is what you believe and not some writings by someone else who claims to know what the truth is. It's the word of God that contains the truth. So, uh, I, I just thought you might find that interesting uh, to hear about this Gospel of Judas before we read our verses today. And um, let's pick up at chapter 13, verse 21. Oh, let me read verse 20 first. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. All right, now let's pick up at verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. 
He leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom said to him, Lord, whom is it? Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things we have need of for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So the first thing I want you to notice about this passage is Judas was treacherous. So this passage contains both great tragedy and great victory. Now imagine for a moment what it would have been like to have walked with Jesus for three years like Judas did. See all the miracles that Jesus performed. Hear the teaching of Jesus yourself personally. This man had the greatest opportunities and he failed. He turned away from Jesus. You know, the life of Judas can show us someone can claim to be a follower. They can, uh, I was about to say, they can even be the treasurer of the church, but I'll not say that. Well, anyway, <laughs> they could be a deacon. They could be a pastor. Claim to be a follower of Jesus and not really be following him like Judas. Many people tend to think in our country that education is solution. That's the solution for our culture. Just educate people. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, by the way, I'm an educator. I believe in education. But education is not the answer. It's Jesus who is the answer. We need to know about him. And Judas had the greatest opportunity to know about him. By the way, I don't think Judas was ever a true believer Jesus said in, in a verse, uh, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Notice he did not say one of you will become a devil. Judas was never a true follower in his heart of the Lord Jesus. It's, it, to me, it's just remarkable that he saw all these miracles, and yet he was never a true believer. It's possible to have an interest in Scripture, to have a concern for needy people and even act and talk like a Christian and not be a true believer. Now, I'm not trying to get someone to doubt their salvation. I'm just saying this is the reality. And Jesus says, John 13, 18, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And Jesus is citing Psalms 41 verse 9. He's indicating the betrayal of Judas is a fulfillment of prophecy. You know, I've been opposed by people who are, you know, my adversaries. But the, the most difficult of opposition I've ever had has been from people who I thought were my friends, people I trusted. 
and they would cheat me or lie about me or something. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just saying when a good friend or someone you thought was a good friend betrays you, that can hurt greatly. Now, do you? I'd be interested to know what you think. You can tell me later if you want to. Did God choose? Uh, pardon me. Did God cause Judas to betray Jesus? I don't believe so. I believe God foreknew, Jesus foreknew, that Judas would do this. But Judas was guilty of his sin. It's not that God or Jesus wanted Judas to do this. So, uh, I, I'd ask you, don't think for a moment that God made Judas betray Jesus. Just because God knows what will happen doesn't mean he makes it happen. Okay. Uh, Jesus knew that Judas, Judas would betray him, but he did not desire Judas to do that. He did not make him do it. And I think indeed he was, uh, he was saddened by what Judas did, even though he knew it was a fulfillment of Scripture. And Jesus says, truly, truly, in verse 20, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. The death of Jesus on the cross would not end his ministry. The disciples would continue to represent him. And anyone who accepted the disciples and sought to encourage them and support them, they would in turn be accepting Jesus and recommending him and, and the Father as well. All right, so Judas followed Jesus but never really accepted him. Judas was treacherous. Now notice, Jesus was troubled. Look at verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. We sometimes may have the idea that Jesus was never troubled by anything. That's simply not true. Uh, he was troubled at times. And this is one of those times. I believe the betrayal of Judas troubled him. And he knew what was coming. He wept at the lostness of Jerusalem because he knew 40 years later, after his death, that the Romans would destroy Jerusalem and, and many, many Israelite Jewish people would be killed. And he was troubled, I believe, by the intense hate of the scribes and Pharisees. Now what's interesting to me uh, is really what's, part of what's interesting to me is in John 13, 22, when, when the uh, disciples find out that someone's going to betray Jesus, and it says in verse 22, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Um, looking at one another, who is it that's going to betray? Is it I? Listen to the account from Matthew 26, verses 22 and 20 through 25. It says, being deeply grieved, that is the disciples at the thought of one of them betraying Jesus. Each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord, surely not me. And he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The son of man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Now part of what's interesting to me is the disciples were not accusing one another. They were saying, Is it I? They were having doubts about themselves. And that really seems kind of strange to me. 
And notice the love that Jesus was exhibiting to Judas in this. In other words, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. How did Jesus know that? That should have caused some bells to start ringing in Judas's head. How did, Judas, how did Jesus know I was going to betray him? I haven't told anybody except those, you know, the people that, uh, how did he know this? And, and furthermore, the, uh, the rest of the disciples really didn't know that it was Judas at this point. Now, they, we do have an indication that they, they realized it was Judas, but I think it was later, and I'll explain why in a moment. Judas was treacherous, Jesus was troubled, and God's love was tri triumphant. Let's go back to verse 23 for a moment. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. I believe that's the Apostle John. Did you know that the Apostle John uh, does not refer to himself as uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John by his own name? That I, I couldn't find it. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, it's not, he's not saying he's the only disciple Jesus loved. Instead, he's focusing on the love of God for him. He felt such a great sense of God's love that that's the way he wanted to identify himself. The, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, uh, Satan wants us, by the way, to focus on our sins and our failures. Please focus on God's love for you. He loves you and I despite our failures and our sins. <laughs> I'm chuckling because I've got plenty of failures and sins in my life. I mean, I'm re repenting of them. I'm seeking to turn away from them and, and when God shows me. And, uh, but in, in, the, in our past, all of us have had failures. All of us have had times of sin. And God wants us to realize he loves us. He's forgiven us of, of those things. And again, this is part of what uh, I see about, uh, about John. He, he just, he was, uh, had such a close relationship with the Lord that he only wanted to refer him to himself as the one who, the disciple whom Jesus loved. God wants all of us to have that type of relationship. And, and it says in verse 24, Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, um, uh, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. So he, that is John, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, and I think he probably whispered, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, and after the, the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Verse 28, now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. You would think, well, surely John would have known this. I don't think he realized it until later. In other words, these disciples had no reason at this point in, in their ministry with Jesus to question Judas. They, they did not realize he was the one who was going to betray Jesus. But Jesus prophesied this was going to happen as a fulfillment of prophecy. And he's telling them in advance so they will know when it happens that he knew it was going to happen in its further evidence of who he really is. Uh, and by the way, I think that uh, John was uh, sitting right next to Judas, uh, Jesus on his right. And that raises the question, who was sitting on his left? Now, we don't know for sure, but if it was Peter, why didn't Peter just lean back and ask Jesus this question? Why did he ask John to ask the question? 
Now, my thinking is it may have been that Judas was on the left of Jesus. And that's why he could dip the morsel in Jesus' cup. Uh, I don't know for sure. But again, my point is, they did not realize Judas was the one who was going to betray uh, Jesus at this point. Oh, and here's something interesting. If Peter was going to become the new pope, why didn't he just ask Jesus himself? You may say, well, this was before he became the new pope. Uh, no. There, <laughs> there is no need for a pope. You can go directly to the Lord Jesus and pray to him. You do not need to go to a priest to pray for you. You can go directly to the Lord Jesus. Now, there are times it's good to have other Christians pray for us, but we don't need a pope. We need the word of God, and we need Jesus, and we can go to the word of God as believers. We can go to uh, God directly. We don't need a pope to tell us what to believe. We have the word of God. So, uh, and by the way, in, uh, in Acts chapter 15, uh, you've got Peter at this council meeting, and who's in charge? It's not Peter, it's James. James is the one who's moderating the meeting. And, and so uh, don't ever think of Peter as the first pope. He's not. There, there's no need for a pope. So, and again, it's not wrong to, uh, to ask Christians questions. <coughs> But I would encourage you, go to the Lord Jesus first. Go to his word and pray to him when you're having questions. So I want us to look at uh, God's triumphant love and the apostate Judas. I believe Jesus was showing love to Judas at this time. He could, Jesus could have pinpointed the, the traitor right there in the midst of them, but he didn't. He did it, but it was in a way that the other disciples didn't really get it. And I think he, Jesus was showing kindness to Judas, even though he knew Judas was about to betray him. But would you believe that some of the toughest people it is for me to love are the people who betray me? <laughs> or people who uh, believe lies about me and seek to oppose me? And that's probably true with you too. And I need, I need God's help. By the way, I'm not looking at anyone here that uh, feels that way about me that I know of. Uh, but I'm just saying, that's when I, have, I feel the greatest need for God's work in my life is when I've got to go and seek to minister to someone and love someone, encourage someone who, who doesn't like me at all and is opposed to me. Uh, now this, this uh, dipping... Uh, the, the morsel in the dish. This is something that you would allow a close friend to do. And we have this account from the book of Ruth. Uh, she, she, uh, she was kind to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she had harvested some grain in the field. And in Ruth chapter two, verses 13 and 14, she said um, to Boaz, this was before they were married, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. In other words, dip your bread in my cup. It was a way of showing kindness. And Jesus showed an act of kindness to Judas by letting him do that, by, by doing that. Uh, and by the way, the name Iscariot means man from Kirioth. That's what it actually means. That's the way the disciples identified Judas because there were actually two men, two disciples named Judas that was part of their group. And then in verse 27, it says that Satan, after the morsel, Satan entered into Judas, and Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. 
Again, I think Judas was sitting close by. And the other disciples heard this. They thought, well, maybe he's going out to buy some something for the feast. You know, he's got the, the treasury. He's got the money. And that's what we find in verse 20. 20 maybe he's buying something for the for the poor. It says in verse 29, um, we see God's triumphant love in the apostle John the, and Judas. And then God's tri triumphant love and the glory of Christ. Look at verse 31 and 32. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So here's a traitor about to betray Jesus. Jesus is going to be put on the cross, and now is the Son of Man glorified. Uh, maybe when Jesus was baptized and this dove came down out of heaven, maybe that would have been a time to be glorified. Maybe when he met with Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, maybe even when Lazarus was raised from the dead, maybe that would have been the time Jesus was glorified. But here's the irony. It's when he's placed on the cross for our sins and he cries out, Father, for why have you forsaken me? And that is when he is glorified. That's when he is glorified. He dies a disgraceful death like a common criminal. And he's glorified in that process. In light of his approaching death, Jesus sought to prepare his disciples for what was coming and he explained to his disciples keep in mind they had just recently been arguing about who's most important here it's me I'm most important that's what they were kind of thinking and Jesus said no you need to change love it, now it's, he says it's a new commandment it's a commandment they've had in the past in the Old Testament but he says, what's new about it now is this is what's going to make the difference among you. This is what's going to set you apart as Christians in this world where there is not the love. You are to love one another as, and he says, as, as I have loved you. And the death of Jesus glorified God Jesus performed the greatest work of all eternity by his substitution, our sins for his righteousness. He took our sins upon himself so we could have his righteousness in it. In, in, uh, so he was just, there was just condemnation for sin. He took it upon himself. That reflected the holiness of God. God doesn't just forgive everyone. He's willing to, but only those who will receive his forgiveness. And so there's many ways in which Jesus brought glory to God. And then we spoke of the new commandment. Uh, he says in verse 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. As I've grown in my Christian faith, this has become more impressed upon my heart that I need to seek to love others as the Lord Jesus has loved me. I'm still working at it. <laughs> I'm still working at it. But this is something that that I hope all of us will take into our hearts and seek to implement in our lives. Um, love is the badge of Christian discipleship. Now I want you to think about the difference between Judas and his sin and Peter and his sin. Peter, shortly after these events, that we're reading about would deny the Lord three times. That was sin. That was sin. 
Judas betrayed Jesus. But keep in mind the difference here. And I'm not excusing Peter's sin when I say this. But Judas was cold-blooded, premeditated in what he did. Judas, pardon me, Peter, uh, he, he meant to give his life for the Lord. He was a brave person. He was the one who stepped out and walked on the water. He was the one who took out a sword and cut off someone's ear with it in, in the Gets, Garden of Gethsemane. He was a brave man, and it was at the point of his strongest that he fell, and he betrayed Jesus, or denied him, if you prefer to put it that way. Any of us can fall, even at the area we think we're strongest, we can fall, any of us can do that. Also, keep in mind, Jesus warned Peter that this would happen, and he still fell. Even when someone warns us, we can still fall. And then, again, Peter fell at what? The area where he thought he was strongest. If someone said something, he was always willing to speak up. He was always willing to take the first step. He fell where he was strongest. And again, the, what, I, what I love so much about these verses is Jesus shows his love to the man named Judas who will betray him. And he also shows his love to all the other disciples and he's willing to forgive any of us. Would he have been willing to forgive Judas? Yes. I am undoubtedly convinced he would have been willing to forgive Judas if Judas had sought repentance and forgiveness. But he didn't. Uh, I hope and pray all of you have trusted Christ as your Savior. And I want to remind you that regardless of whatever you've done in life, God is willing to forgive, but he also wants you to put him first in your life and love him with all your heart. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I thank you that you, in a sense, put us first by going to the cross. It was not something you wanted to do, it was something you were willing to do because of your love for us. As John 3.16 indicates, <coughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Lord, you love us more than we know. Lord, help us to grow in our relationship with you and help us to love others the way you love us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing a hymn of invitation. If someone wants to come for prayer, rededication, some other commitment.